Assalamu alaikum. It's a difficult uh, session in the afternoon after such a heavy lunch. So I hope you will stay with us. First and foremost, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Asma Jahangir Foundation for giving us, for inviting us. As you can see on this panel, there is nobody from Pakistan. It's all us, visitors from outside. We are so uh, grateful to be here, so appreciative of this opportunity to participate in the Asma Jahangir Conference. And this session actually is another part of Asma's great legacy. This is a panel primarily by South Asians for Human Rights, which was started by the stalwarts of human rights of the South Asia region 22 years back. Um, some of us, there's a long history to how it got started, but there was a very, very exciting conference 22 years back in a place called Nimrana near Delhi where many of us joined the organization because of the stalwarts who were there for understanding better concepts of democracy and human rights, but also for our protection. We always felt if we were close to these people that, you know, contentious issues, we would be able to maneuver far more strategically and far more easily. So this is part of that legacy. Today we have a South Asia panel. We have speakers from Sri Lanka, Nepal, and India talking about democracy and human rights. Before we start off, I just want to say, I mean, I actually arrived here with a very, very uh, despondent and dismal kind of uh, attitude towards democracy. Is it even working? What is it? You know, we need to have a whole new narrative of talking about democracy because as we understand it no longer exists, or at least in my country, doesn't seem to exist anymore. But sitting through yesterday's panels and the whole trajectory of fight for democracy in Pakistan, I must tell you, like Asma, I mean, she was always inspirational, but yesterday's little snippets here and there and the whole trajectory of struggle for democracy in Pakistan really gave me hope that there is still hope and we can always reinvent and renegotiate and reimagine human rights and democracy. The other thing which struck me was uh, comment which was made by one of the speakers that South Asia is so close, but it is the most disintegrated region of the world. And that was a very sobering and very sad thought. And part of what Seher was, South Asians for Human Rights and why people like Asma Jahangir, Rahman Saab, Kuldeep Nair, I.K. Gujral and so many others got together was to not to allow this disintegration to happen, to try and integrate South Asia because there was so much passion across borders and how we work. So this, this uh, panel is, I hope at the end of it, we come up with some, more, with some strategies, some thoughts, some reflections of how we can keeping democracy and human rights in the forefront how can we stop further disintegration of this region? And how can we consolidate the tremendous potential, tremendous power of the peoples of South Asia to take this region forward in a different way? I hope we will have some ideas from the speakers. One of the things of democracy and human rights, again, from panels yesterday, was they either exist together or they perish together. And uh, so that is a very, very uh, uh, kind of integral connection, but it's also a very fragile one, that if one perishes, the other perishes too. And democracy, as we are seeing it around us, 
There is a high level today of giving emphasis on certain aspects of democracy and not so much on others. There is in my own country a tremendous focus on elections, for instance. But there is no focus at all to look at how do we engage with opponents and how do we engage with opposition. Why is today the whole process of politics understood in terms of a vilification of the opponent. There is an out and out vilification of the opponent. How do, can we stop that and engage in a matter which is in a manner which is more uh, mature, uh, which is more substantive and which builds rather than disintegrates. The second aspect that is deeply troubling in these times is the kind of uh, curbing of dissent, which is the core issue of this, organ of this conference, that democracy cannot be a strangulation or annihilation of liberties and freedoms. And panel after panel, we have listened to people talking about the strangulation of voices of dissent and so on. So keeping these aspects in mind, I invite our esteemed speakers. Our first speaker is Sarah. Sarah is one of the most eminent human rights uh, activists, thinker, uh, and thought leader, analyst of South Asia. She, he says it's enough, but there's a long, long list. He is on the Bureau of South Asians for Human Rights from Sri Lanka. Uh, he's the founder executive director for the Center for Policy Alternatives. He was member also of the Foreign Policy Advisory Group and Board of the Lakshman uh, Kadir Gamar Institute for International and Strategic Studies and very many, very many uh, feathers and not just feathers, but substantive feathers on Sarah's head. So I invite you with that <laughs> to go ahead. Yeah. So we look at an analysis of the present context, challenges, and way forward. Yeah. Thank you. Feathers off my head and feel a bit more lightheaded as I address the questions of democracy and human rights, challenges, and opportunities. As the moderator said, I mean, the two are integral to each other, they are pivotal to each other, and I don't think you can really talk about democracy without human rights and vice versa. However, I think there are certain dimensions to this topic that need emphasizing in a sense. We are talking about both political and civil rights as well as economic and social rights. This is an old story in terms of you have challenges in terms of both of these things. And also, we are talking about formal functioning democracy, where we have processes like elections, but we're also talking about substantive elements of democracy, whereby the processes do not in any way obscure the actual spirit of democracy, the ethos of democracy in public life. And I think in South Asia, and not necessarily South Asia alone, <clears throat> today the world is facing something of a backlash against globalization. And as a consequence of that, minorities are being singled out everywhere in the world, particularly in South Asia, as being scapegoats of some kind or another. The majority communities in our society are obviously insecure because of an external threat. In Sri Lanka, we talk about a majority community with a minority complex. And that insecurity, therefore, de leaves them with the default position of blaming the minorities for everything, particularly with regard to the access to resources and the reproduction of those resources. In Sri Lanka, for example, the minority communities are the most hooked in to 
the international network of globalization. Language, which has been used quite often as a key marker of authoritarianism and majoritarianism, as far as our societies are concerned, the minority communities are probably the most multilinguistic. Certainly within Sri Lanka, the Muslim community is the truly trilingual community in the country. And so there is a backlash against it in terms of the argument that they are the ones who are having greater access to resources and because of their cultural practices, etc., this notion of this one great state where the majority community has found its home and where there is no external influences or if there are external uh, segments of the population, they are there because the majority community is willing to tolerate them and therefore, as the president of my country once said, we have the spoon and we have the pot of rice and we will dole it out or serve it as we see fit. So the identification of minorities as being problematic, as being threats, dangers, has therefore a knock-on impact on the survival of democracy. I think most of our societies, either formally or informally, have been organized around the principle of unity and diversity. Because at the end of the day, we are societies that are made up of various peoples, all of whom who have contributed towards the commonwealth and the collective good. But now I think what is happening is, is that the majoritarianism is trying to come up with one country, one law type of argument, which obliterates this notion of unity in diversity. And one country, one law, whilst it might appeal to some people as being a sort of notion of common civil code and all of that, is a way in which the majoritarianism asserts itself. Secondly, I want to suggest to you that as far as human rights and democracy are concerned, we have a challenge and that is to incorporate corruption as a human right into the general discourse of human rights. Again, corruption is a cancer. It is impunity that goes with it. It is an absolute cancer that corrodes the entire body politic and the economy as well. And we have to treat it as being a squandering, a pilfering, a looting of what belongs to all of us. And therefore, that it is our human right to know what has happened to our money, how it has been spent, that there is accountability that goes with it. We recently had a session at the Human Rights Council in Geneva where they passed a resolution on Sri Lanka and introduced this notion of economic crimes, whereby the question of accountability in terms of the corruption, the whole scale looting of the public finances has been now put on the agenda and we need to develop it. We need to develop it further. We have to make sure that the offshore tax havens and all of that are brought into this ambit so that corruption is not going to be a scourge of democracy in our countries. The third area I think we need to look at and incorporate much more fully into our discourse of human rights and democracy is the environment. That is something that belongs to all of us or we, it is everyone's concern. That is something as well which forces, if nothing else, an interdependence among states to come together to deal with. It is not something that can be divided up into this is my sovereign territory and therefore I can do whatever I wish. It is everywhere, all over. 
and we need to incorporate it into our discourse on human rights as very, very fundamental and into our discourse on democracy as well because it's not just a question of what the majority wants but it is also a question of how we treat our minorities and all other interests. The fourth area that I want to talk to you about and I am going to be more specific is all of this conversation about the center of the world shifting from Europe and North America to the East. And therefore, the con conflict or the competition between China and India is going to be the key axis of competition and possibly conflict into the future. Now, India has been a long-standing democracy in South Asia and indeed in the world. China, of course, is a totalitarian or authoritarian state which has just made its president, given its president another term in office. What is the future going to be in terms of the competition or indeed the conflict, and I don't necessarily think that there is going to be conflict as such, but the competition between these two. Is India going to be the exemplar of democracy, liberalism, tolerance? Is China going to be at the other end of the pole in terms of authoritarianism, in terms of squashing of dissent and all of that? Or is it the case that they are going to become more like each other. And when I say more like each other, it means that India is going to become more authoritarian. As to whether China is going to become more democratic, I think the jury is out on that. But I think as we go on, as we go into the future, that system is also going to have to cave in to the stresses and strains that it faces. So at a collective level into the future, I think in South Asia we all have a responsibility, those of us who believe in democracy and human rights, to ensure that that is maintained within our societies to begin with that that is not going to be, you know, you mind your own business, we are a sovereign state and we will do whatever we damn well want. As I said at the opening plenary session, we, are, we need societies where institutions do not humiliate citizens. That is the structural, the procedural, the institutional dimensions of democracy and human rights. And as I said, most importantly, you need a political culture that animates those structures and makes sure that they function in the way that they are supposed to. Therefore, citizens must not humiliate each other. So if we can commit ourselves to that, we are talking about constitutional changes, we are talking about a variety of changes within our societies to keep up with the world as we uh, as technology proceeds apace, but we must not lose sight of those first principles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for those very, very powerful comments. Citizens must not humiliate each other. It captures it all when you're talking about majoritarianism and minority communities in your... Everyone is a citizen. One you cannot, in a democracy, you cannot humiliate another citizen in your own country. So with that very powerful statement, I turn to India, to Rita, and to what Sarah mentioned about this long-standing democracy. And what is your perspective on that? Rita is, uh, has also been very, very integrally involved 
uh, in South Asia, has done extensive research and work independently on women, peace and security, on conflict transformation and as part of the Indo-Pak uh, Peace Forum. Uh, and as also as part of her organization, South Asia Forum for Human Rights, Safar. So we have Sahar and we have Safar. Rita has been the executive director, the research director of Safar for very many years. So Rita, over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, actually, what I was asked to speak on was um, human rights and democracy but from the perspective of the geopolitical changes that are taking place. Um, so um, I will, in fact, draw upon the opening that Sarah gave to us, which is the world is changing. Globalization, the unipolar world um, has Fundament. There's been template shifts. In fact, there is at the moment a re-shifting, a realignment, and confusion in the global order. But before I go into that, let me um, just pull up something else. Um, very recently, um, in fact, last week, um, the Indian Foreign Minister Jay Shankar, uh, he was speaking on India-China and the implications of the new uh, uh, developments in China. Uh, but he used a phrase and he said, what is happening and is likely to happen with, between India and China makes it all the more important that we engage with our periphery. And I put this in quote. Periphery is a very pejorative term. It is, in fact, an imperial term. It is the kind of term that the British used. Your empire, you're the, cent you're the metropolis, and all around you is the periphery. Not really important, but yes, relevant. Now, what does that mean? That means Pakistan is periphery? Does that mean Nepal is periphery? Does that mean Sri Lanka is? Maldives is? Bhutan is? Afghanistan is? These are all South Asia. So it is a very pejorative term. So while at one level, what he's saying is actually important because he's saying we must be much more serious in our engagement with our neighbors. And um, constructive engagement with our neighbors, but he is still looking at them as periphery. So in a sense, you can almost say it's like a default spin. Without thinking, he said it. But he is, after all, a professional diplomat as well. Now, um, the reason that it's important, I mean, this, uh, the term and this way of looking at the region is important is because India is, in fact, crucial, given its, its size, its population, its resources, it is, after all, uh, it is, in fact, the lodestar. If some, uh, and therefore the responsibility on India is huge. But if, in fact, its relations, now, I was, last evening, I was having a casual conversation with my neighbor from Nepal. And he said, you know, one of the problem, the real problem is India. And I thought, Nepal's problems are many, they're multiple, but many of them are also internal problems. And yet, there is also a default spin in Nepal that the problem is Indian. Now, even in Sri Lanka, and I have lived in all these countries and worked in all these countries, um, in Sri Lanka, too, I kept getting told the problem is India. But as I was talking to my neighbor from Sri Lanka yesterday, um, and I asked him, I said, when Sri Lanka went into an economic meltdown just a few weeks ago, a, a couple of months ago, um, India had given $3.8 billion as immediate aid. Um, at that point of time, the Discussions with the IMF were continuing and are still continuing. Um, a great many other countries were also 
um, thinking very seriously of extending aid, but they hadn't done it yet. China too, for whatever reasons, had not extended. So in a sense, it was India that at the most crucial moment for Sri Lanka extended a hand. Now you've all heard about vaccine diplomacy. Um, it is a fact that we botched it up because we didn't plan on how much the domestic demand would be and we're making these commitments for a vaccine mantri, vaccine friend, friendship month, uh, vaccines. And yes, there were uh, to Nepal, to Bangladesh and so forth. But the fact is that is to do with botched planning, um, not an exception. But it is, it just shows you that it was considered important and the critical role that India, if it wishes to, can play. Now, part of the real scare for me is, and I go to a lot of strategic dialogues, is because I find a lot of people are saying, why are we just using soft power? That is, you know, diplomacy, uh, aid, um, vaccine diplomacy. Why shouldn't we use hard power? I mean, what is this that Sri Lanka almost, well, has in fact entered in entered into a very long-term agreement, which has given really almost territorial powers to China and this uh, port, which is near Colombo, um, and that's the Hamban Tota port, and their warship was, naval warship was about to uh, dock there, and India said, what? What are you doing? I mean, they put pressure, and it was delayed. It was not stopped, it was delayed. Now, the fact is, within the strategic community in India, it was said, see, if we'd used hard power, if we'd brought, like the US would have uh, would have brought the USS, um, what is it, um, not, in, uh, anyway, if the US had deployed its naval fleet, you, you would have seen how they would have reacted. We should do things like that. So there's a lot of very, un, very, very uh, unsettling thinking going on, but, why this all becomes important and important for regional cooperation for us is the fact is the international order is changing. It's changing in the sense that, and partly the Ukraine war has reinforced it, the UN system, and the UN system is after all what? It's just a system of states. So if the states don't really want to do it, the UN will be weak. Where is the UN in this Ukraine um, uh, war? Where is the Ukraine in, uh, where is the UN when it actually matters right these days? It is no long, it no longer has the power. It no longer has the influence it has had. And therefore to look to the UN, uh, even in terms of human rights, even in terms of democracy, it's important, but there is a, limit to what they're able to do. There's a limit to what any of the international organizations are now willing or able to do. Um, and this includes climate change, this includes a whole host of areas. Then there is this whole issue of multilateral power. You know, uh, one is, I look at Europe and I see what is happening on the Ukraine war, and I really, it's, it's a joke, but I wonder if it's really a joke. Does Europe have a foreign policy anymore? Or is it just following what the US wants? And the US has a real, is actually, it doesn't, this war doesn't cost the US very much. So in a, because it has its oil, it, uh, defense industries are heavily in demand producing for the war. So in a sense, it is, um, we are in a uh, situation where the international community that many of us look to are actually just not available to render us the kind of support that we, had, we could have expected earlier. Um, China and India are the new fulcrum points. But here also, um, there was a dialogue that I attended, um, not in, 
virtual dialogue because this is the f first time I've come to Pakistan in, in many years. Um, and it was, I will not say who it was because you all know the person. He's a Pakistani public intellectual. And um, uh, he was, the question he was asked by an Indian was, an Indian journalist was that, you know, um, you have no, um, I mean, Pakistan's um, was greatly strengthened by its geostrategic value in terms of its location because of Afghanistan, because of the Taliban, because of being a frontline state. Now that that rental value, and the phrase used was a very pejorative phrase, that rental value is not there, what will happen to Pakistan? And the person said, well, and he smiled and he said, you know, you don't know what will happen with India and China. If that happens, Pakistan's rental value will again be valuable again. So in a sense, we are in a um, situation of great flux. What I'm saying is that in the um, foreign offices of our countries, there is a lot of rethinking that's going on. South Asia has suddenly become extremely important for, in fact, the international community. Partly it is India, because India is in a, what they call a very sweet position. It speaks to China. Uh, well, no, it speaks to Russia. It speaks to, uh, it can speak to the U uh, Ukraine and to the Western world as well. So in a sense, it's um, not neutrality, but it's um, ambivalent ambiguity is in fact placing it in a position of power. And so there is a lot of wooing of India. I'm not even going into what is happening internally and the fact that it's no longer considered even to be a real democracy by the, in terms of international indexes on what is democracy. But the important thing is that this is a moment where India feels that it is actually a, a rising power. It is the ascendant power. Ascendant powers need to, in, uh, to secure uh, their geopolitical situation. They need to have good engagements and intensive engagements with their neighbors. If our state governments, if our polis, uh, political um, parties are thinking like this, why is it that we in civil society are no longer really active on this front. I mean, we, there was one session on food security and livelihood. What Sri Lanka and what um, um, Pakistan can learn from each other. I mean, there is so much that is possible. Yes, the India-Pakistan axis is a major problem, but where is the, the problem in terms of at least beginning that re-engagement? Uh, there was a time when uh, all I'm going to close with this. There was a time when there was a great deal of regional thinking. How are you going to solve your minority problem without looking at it regionally, particularly since South Asia is a kin state system where the minority in one place is a majority in the other. Refugees, all these require regional thinkings. Where is the civil society response? Why is it that our states are thinking much faster than we are and why are we in civil society lagging behind about, once again, South Asian networking? And this time, there won't be any donors really to support us. We will have to do it ourselves. Thank you, sorry. Thank you. From that, we move to Nepal. Nepal, as we all know, and I'm, I always feel very proud to say that the only country in South Asia that is was not colonized. All of us were colonized. We were under some <laughs> rule or the other. So Nepal was an independent country with a lot of its own problems, but definitely not colonized. And uh, it at one point gave us a lot of hope with the people's movement. One was part of many such uprisings in Nepal. Uh, but we need to know where we are today and no better than Sh Shushil. I'd like to introduce Sushil uh, Pyakurel. He is a well-known human rights defender of Nepal 
the former commissioner of the National Human Rights Commission. He was also the founder member of INSEC and very many others and has been has served on very critical committees to the president and to other high level uh, power centers in Nepal. So over to you, Sushil. And he is also a bureau member of South Asians for Human Rights. Thanks, uh, uh, Asma Jahangir Foundation, uh, for bringing me here uh, uh, to, to, to express my opinion and share with you. Uh, and also learn from your movement and how you are working. Uh, my tribute goes to Asma, our friend, long time friend I would say, and uh, friend in his struggle. Uh, I was here uh, in the invitation of uh, Asma uh, long time back, I don't remember the year. Uh, but I R Rahman, I work with I R Rahman, uh, Asma, and Asma is uh, uh, in Nepal. If you talk to uh, any human rights defender, certainly they would not consider Asma as a Pakistani. For for us, uh, she is a real South Asian, uh, and I'm I'm proud that. Uh, I am a bureau member of SAR, which she established. And, uh, you know, sometimes we become emotional also. When I hear that somebody somewhere late Asma Jagir, I don't think that uh, she is late. She is with us. That's why we are here. So her spirit is with us. And we are following her spirit. So with this word, I will just, after, you know, listening to my friend, uh, Sri Lanka, India, but they talk about the world, the reason, what is happening, all. So I will be a bit, you know, uh, 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 grounding to, to, to my reality. Uh, Nepal was, yes, not colonized, but always we feel that we are some countries, especially India, treat us as a, their colony, where we are, uh, we have a lot of problem. And of course, we are very much close to India also. That doesn't mean that Nepal is the country where India and Nepal, we have open border. We don't need visa. You can go India anytime you want. And Indians can come, come to Nepal anytime they want and they can stay as long as they want. So, you know, this is a country, where, I mean, these both, we have very good relations, but among the people. People are very close. Not only, you know, India, you know, I'm just, while coming here, when Bhutto was arrested, I was here, that time I was young, and I was uh, working for a uh, newspaper. So can you imagine during Jiaul Hat, I came here by crossing the Waga border and we were trying to meet Bhutto in the jail, which was not possible. <laughs> and we returned. That time in Nepal also, we were fighting the king's regime, Panchayat, where our leader BP Koirala was in jail. And there was a case against him, demanding this, you know, he tried to overthrow the throne, that is king's king. That's why the demand was uh, to, for the capital punishment. The case was there. And here the same thing happened. After some time, Bhutto was hung. And we were very much, you know, scared that maybe it happened to BP Koiral also. Look at how people think alike. Then we thought that, you know, maybe this is the time we must oppose. And we were, as a student, we were going to Pakistan embassy to for the, for submit our protest letter. 
And what happened? The Nepal police in Kathmandu, they reacted very brutally. And the consequence was, in whole Nepal, there was demonstration, agitation, and eventually, the king surrendered. Bipi Kwarala was released. Here, Puttu was hanged. There, Bipi Kwarala was released. And we reintroduced multi-party parliamentary democracy. So that is the link between Pakistan and Nepal. We had direct flight, Karachi to Kathmandu. I came here quite a number of times. But no, that's what I am saying. But after the hijack of Indian Airlines, it was not our fault. But then India put restriction. That's why this time I came here. Can you imagine I went to Dubai, Dubai to Lahore. Three hour flight, now seven hour. So what do we do then? Why we have Sahar? Why you invite us? When coming here, I was talking to my friend. Well, everybody, we, all of us know what is happening in our country. We are the victim. We, we haven't done anything wrong. The flood, the effect of climate change. We are the worst victim of the climate change. And the mistake or crime, I would say, is inflicted by the so-called developed countries. They consume everything. And the, now we are facing the consequences. We have a lot of discussion on that. So what we do? We need our cooperation, people-to-people -people cooperation. What happened? As Rita was saying, you know, few years back, there was, of course, the SAC. It is also another organization of state. But still, there was something moving on. Some SARC understanding on trafficking, on food security. All these things were happening, you know, slowly. And we also, we call it People's Sark. We were assembled in, you know, Kathmandu. Wherever the Sark summit was happening, you know, we were going there. But now, the Sark stopped, I think, 2014. There was a Sark summit in Nepal. And Nepal is the chair of the Sark. And 2018, it was decided to hand over to Pakistan. But as a cheer, and we know the elephant in the room. We know that what is happening, why it is not happening. I know who are the ruler. Of course, India is considered as a democratic, largest democracy of the world. But Rita is saying, Maybe you also say that India is no more a democratic country. Of course, there is election. Uh, Nepal, we have the same problem, internal problem, what you are facing. But still, we are, I would not say better, but still we are very much welcoming. Our government is also welcoming. They have not also put any restriction on uh, any citizen of the world. Afghan is different, but still, <laughs> but still, that's what I'm saying. And at least that's why what my proposal, uh, before coming here, I was talking to my colleagues that what to bring. We are going there to discuss, to talk in a program where I, our, in remembering our icon, she was a South Asian. So what we bring there from Nepal, what can we say? So everybody, we are saying that, you know, like, can we do something? Rita mentioned that, you know, uh, Pakistan, India, there was, uh, Tapan was very much involved. You all were involved, but it, it has stopped somehow. So can we 
restart this type of you know uh, initiation at least if you do something you decide to do something we can help you at least we can talk to the government or we don't need to talk to government because this is the rule you can easily come to nepal so let us try to reorganize our you know contact of course uh, you know uh, covid it is stopped us for two year but now the states are opening up they are meeting they are making their own strategy they are engaging it themselves even united states were engaged with taliban can you imagine so in this situation you know i think we people must engage must talk to each other and we i offer from nepal that you all are most welcome we'll try to do whatever we can do thank you very much thank you very much sushil on uh, ending this on a positive note nepal for me has always been a positive note <laughs> whenever we have <laughs> thank you one last quick just one one line from all three of you and then we are closing this i'm very sorry we cannot open it up for questions but people are around so you can ask questions as they go by sara any last comment well i think my my last comment is this is, is that we must resist the attempts at moving away from the unity in diversity concept for organizing our societies and strengthen the link between human rights and democracy thank you rita in support of labor rights in support of workers rights a great many social movements farmers movements these we need to link up with them they are now at the moment all working in silos we need to link with them and we to need to link across the border we too have strength we ourselves who have disempowered ourselves thank you shushil one more last positive note oh, no. i have already <laughs> mentioned that you know like we have to bring energy in us that you know not talking that we are se being separated but let's try to find out the way where we can come together when should we come to nepal oh next month so the general consensus is we will try and sahar actually already initiated this discussion that we will try endeavor to meet very soon as a collective in nepal that is nepal is the only country where you yeah. don't need a visa yes that's the issue that's very good for you, the first side country south east yes but that's good we can meet over there meet in nepal is our final let's, let's, last line let's make nepal a people's capital so kathmandu <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good thought <laughs> Okay let's end this session thank you very much for being here and for your patience <laughs>